you said something earlier about it surpassing or being superior to human intelligence. A lot of people, I think, like to believe that AI is is on a computer and it's something you can just turn off if you don't like it. Well, let me tell you why I think it's superior. Okay. Um, it's digital. And because it's digital, you can have, you can simulate a neural network on one piece of hardware. Yeah. And you can simulate exactly the same neural network on a different piece of hardware. Mm. So you can have clones of the same intelligence. Now, you could get this one to go off and look at one bit of the internet, and this other one to look at a different bit of the internet. And while they're looking at these different bits of the internet, they can be syncing with each other so they keep their weights the same, the connection strings the same, weights of connection strings. Mm -hmm. So this one might look at something on the internet and say, oh, I'd like to increase this strength of this connection a bit. And it can convey that information to this one so it can increase the strength of that connection a bit based on this one's experience. And when you say the strength of the connection, you're talking about learning. That's learning, yes. Yeah. Learning consists of saying, instead of this one giving 2.4 votes for whether that one should turn on, we'll have this one give 2.5 votes for whether this one should okay. turn on. Well, that would be a little bit of learning. Mm -hmm. So these two different copies of the same neural net are getting different experiences. They're looking at different data, but they're sharing what they've learned by averaging their weights together. Mm -hmm. And they can do that averaging at like, a, you can average a trillion weights when you and I transfer information, we're limited to the amount of information in a sentence. And the amount of information in a sentence is maybe 100 bits. It's very little information. We're lucky if we're transferring like 10 bits a second. Mm -hmm. These things are transferring trillions of bits a second. So they're billions of times better than us at sharing information. And that's because they're digital and you can have two bits of hardware using the connection strengths in exactly the same way. We're analog and you can't do that. Your brain's different from my brain. And if I could see the connection strengths between all your neurons, it wouldn't do me any good because my neurons work slightly differently and they're connected up slightly differently. Mm -hmm. So when you die, all your knowledge dies with you. When these things die, suppose you take these two digital intelligences that are clones of each other and you destroy the hardware they run on. As long as you've stored the connection strengths somewhere, you can just build new hardware that executes the same instructions so it'll know how to use those connection strengths, and you've recreated that intelligence. So they're immortal. We've actually solved the problem of immortality, but it's only for digital things. So it knows, it will essentially know everything that humans know, but more, because it will learn new things. It will learn new things. It will also see all sorts of analogies that people probably never saw. So for example, at the point when GPT-4 couldn't look on the web, I asked it, why is a compost heap like an atom bomb? Off you go. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Most, that's exactly what most people would say. It said, well, the time scales are very different, and the energy scales are very different. But then it went on to talk about how a compost heap, as it gets hotter, generates heat faster. And an atom bomb, as it produces more neutrons, generates neutrons faster. Hmm. And so they're both chain reactions but at very different time and energy scales. And I believe GPT-4 had seen that during its training. It had understood the analogy between a compost heap and an atom bomb. And the reason I believe that is, if you've only got a trillion connections, remember you have 100 trillion, mm -hmm. and you need to have thousands of times more knowledge than a person, you need to compress information into those connections. And to compress information, you need to see analogies between different things. In other words, it needs to see all the things that are chain reactions and understand the basic idea of a chain reaction and code that, and then code the ways in which they're different. And that's just a more efficient way of coding things than coding each of them separately. Hmm. So it's seen many, many analogies, probably many analogies that people have never seen. That's why I also think that people who say these things will never be creative. They're going to be much more creative than us because they're going to see all sorts of analogies we never saw. And a lot of creativity is about seeing strange analogies. People are somewhat romantic about the specialness of what it is to be human. And you hear lots of people saying, oh, it's very, very different. It's a, it's a computer. We are, you know, we're conscious. We are creatives. We, we have these sort of innate, unique abilities that the computers will never have. What do you say to those people? I'd argue a bit with the innate. Um, <laughs> so the first thing I say is we have a long history of believing people were special. And we should have learned by now 
We thought we were at the center of the universe. We thought we were made in the image of God. White people thought they were very special. Mm. We just tend to want to think we're special. Mm. My belief is that more or less everyone has a completely wrong model of what the mind is. Let's suppose I drink a lot or I drop some acid mm -hmm. and not recommend it. And I say to you, I have the subjective experience of little pink elephants floating in front of me. Mm -hmm. Most people interpret that as there's some kind of inner theater called the mind, and only I can see what's in my mind. And in this inner theater, there's little pink elephants floating around. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what's happened is my perceptual system's gone wrong, and I'm trying to indicate to you how it's gone wrong and what it's trying to tell me. And the way I do that is by telling you what would have to be out there in the real world for it to be telling the truth. And so these little pink elephants, they're not in some inner theater. These little pink elephants are hypothetical things in the real world. And that's my way of telling you how my perceptual system's telling me fibs. So now let's do that with a chatbot. Yeah. Because I believe that current multimodal chatbots have subjective experiences. And very few people believe that, but I'll try and make you believe it. Mm -hmm. So suppose I have a multimodal chatbot. It's got a robot arm so it can point, and it's got a camera so it can see things. And I put an object in front of it, and I say, point at the object. It goes like this. No problem. Then I put a prism in front of its lens. And so then I put an object in front of it, and I say, point at the object, and it goes there. Good. And I say, no. That's not where the object is. The object's actually straight in front of you, but I put a prism in front of your lens. And the chatbot says, oh, I see, the prism bent the light rays, so um, the object's actually there, but I had the subjective experience that it was there. Hmm. Now, if the chatbot says that, it's using the word subjective experience exactly the way people use them. It's an alternative view of what's going on. They're hypothetical states of the world, which if they were true would mean my perceptual system wasn't lying. And that's the best way I can tell you what my perceptual system's doing when it's lying to me. Mm. Now, we need to go further to deal with sentience and consciousness and feelings and emotions. But I think in the end, they're all going to be dealt with in a similar way. There's no reason machines can't have them all. But people say machines can't have feelings. And people are curiously confident about that. I've no idea why. Suppose I make a battle robot. And it's a little battle robot. And it sees a big battle robot that's much more powerful than it. It would be really useful if it got scared. Mm. Now, when I get scared, um, various physiological things happen that we don't need to go into. And those won't happen with the robot. But all the cognitive things, like I better get the hell out of here. Mm. And I better sort of change my way of thinking so I focus and focus and focus and don't get distracted. All of that will happen with robots too. People will build in things so that they, when it, the circumstances are such they should get the hell out of there, they get scared and run away. They'll have emotions then. They won't have the physiological aspects, but they will have all the cognitive aspects. So, and I think it would be odd to say they're just simulating emotions. No, they're really having those emotions. The little robot got scared and ran away. It's not running away because of adrenaline, it's running away because of a sequence of sort of neurological, in its neural net, Processes happened, yeah, which meant... which have the equivalent effect to adrenaline. So do you? Do you and think... it's not just adrenaline, right? There's a lot of cognitive stuff goes on when you get scared. Yeah. So do you think that there is conscious AI? And when I say conscious, I mean that represents the same properties of consciousness that a human has. There's two issues here. There's a sort of empirical one and a philosophical one. 